Dobrý večer, já vás vítám u našeho Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our seventh evening, which is part of our Inspiration Forum. And in case you don't remember, you can watch us live on our Facebook and on our web page. And you can also use the English version, uh, which is available at YouTube. If you want to comment or to have questions um, for our speakers, feel free to do so. You can do it via YouTube or via Facebook. And now I would like to welcome our panelists. Three of them are online and one of them is here with me in the studio. First, we have Anna Karnikova, who is the director of uh, the Duha movement, Friends of the Earth, Czech Republic, and she will be hosting this debate. The floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Anna Karnikova, and I'm the director of um, the environmental organization Friends of the Earth Czech Republic, and I'm honored to be here as a host. First, I would like to introduce our guests, and then we will start the debate. The current model, which is used in agriculture, has many uh, problematic aspects. It um, contributes to soil degradation, to the presence of pesticides and poisonous substances in water. Also, uh, the, a healthy soil could be an important part of a solution to uh, the climate uh, and landscape crisis. So this is a very important topic and it is strongly linked to agriculture and to uh, the climate protection. This topic is really urgent and we need to make a difference. We need to start changing things, but unfortunately this process is very slow. For example, if we compare it to what happens in the field of energy. So these are some of the questions we will be looking at today with my guests. First of them is Alena Malikova. She has worked in uh, the public sector, in the field of agriculture. She helped uh, create an um, organization for food safety, and she looks at the relationship between man and land. Next, we have Ladislav Miko, who is a former minister of the environment. He uh, has been working for the European Commission and uh, at the General Directorate for Health and Food Safety. Now he, he is the head of the representation of the European Commission in Slovakia. He has published a book which is called Život uh, Pudje, uh, Life and Soil, and uh, this book focuses on a fascinating life of microorganisms living in soil. Good evening. And then we have Jan Steffel, who is a farmer. He uh, manages a farm uh, in the Hradec Králové, Jindřichův Hradec region, uh, and a big part of land is uh, used in an organic way, uh, which is ecological friendly. Now, I would like to start with the first question. At the moment, we are speaking about climate transformation and the changes uh, that we need to adapt to it. Often we lack um, imagination and maybe this is because it is difficult to get rid of the status quo, um, it is difficult to reflect on future and not be dystopian. So I would like this debate to be different. I don't want our audience to be filled with environmental grief and to feel that nothing can ever change and there will be more catastrophes to come. So maybe to start with, I would like to ask you, my guests, uh, what do you think can be transformed in the field of industry? Let's imagine uh, an agriculture in the year 2030, 
uh, when we should have reached um, the carbon neutrality. Let's imagine we have solved the issue of uh, soil depletion and others. And I would like to ask you what this ideal situation looks like. Please mention three most important aspects. And maybe let's start with uh, Madame Malikova. Good evening. Thank you for uh, the occasion to speak here at this forum. I am not really ex an experienced speaker, so maybe I will be slightly clumsy, but I'm really honored to be here. Uh, as for my part, I don't only see it from the perspective of agriculture, but also from the perspective of countryside. This is a place of many opportunities opportunities, a place of uh, important relationships between consumers and producers. These relationships are uh, based on uh, re mutual respect and the agriculture in the countryside relies on a big respect towards nature. So, in my opinion, the future is local. Uh, very clear and uh, respectful of people and of the landscape. We need to have more respect and more trust. Thank you. This was a very nice vision uh, based on relationships and caring uh, for our relationships. The same question for Ladislav. To start with, uh, if I look at the Czech uh, agriculture, I don't think uh, the prospects are so gloom and the situation is so hard. We only need, need small changes. Uh, for example, we need to uh, change the current direction taken by the Czech government. At the moment, they forget about uh, the environmental benefits for the landscape, for uh, countryside, and so on. So the current direction taken by the European Union, and I represent here uh, uh, the agrarian chamber of the Czech Republic. I think that the current direction taken by the European Union is uh, correct, but unfortunately it hasn't been understood or um, adopted by the Czech government so far, and this is a thing we are lacking. So I think we need to adapt and adopt it, and if we manage, uh, I think that would be all right, and the future would be quite bright. Okay, we will also mention the different actors that contribute in changing the situation, and now uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Miko. Well, you were speaking about our visions, and maybe they are not so different from each other. I will speak about my vision. Uh, in 2050, I see a landscape uh, which is at the beginning of uh, November, but uh, everything is still green. Uh, the fields aren't brown, but there are crops that are still alive, uh, that still grow on them. And I see very small fields, which are smaller than 200 hectares. So these are small pieces of a mosaic that um, would be managed in a different way, with different technology, which will be at our disposal. Uh, there will be also a part of uh, land which will be used uh, less extensively because we will need less uh, food production. And more people will be present in the countryside, living their lives there, getting fulfilled because there will be robots in the factories and uh, in uh, shops there will be partly 
robots and partly people who will do the job um, of smiling and interacting with customers, but uh, more opportunities will uh, arise in the countryside. Thank you. I would love to live in such a world in 2050. Now, let's look at uh, the, the answers of uh, people from Ihlava who answered the same question. How the Czech agriculture should change? We should have an answer to every question. Well, in what way we should change the Czech agriculture? We should get rid of agrofert. We should care more for the soil we have. I think the problem is that many agricultures uh, rent uh, the land and they don't really have a relationship to it. I think that small farmers should return and all the system should be based on this, on people who have a relationship towards their land. I think uh, the agriculture should be more sustainable and maybe the main issue is that uh, all of the land is already cultivated and we don't have uh, enough wildlife. Well, I think uh, the animal production is also uh, part of agriculture and unfortunately the conditions are not so good in this field so I hope this changes maybe if we go back a uh, hundred years and if we start managing smaller areas with more diversity maybe this will also lead to a ecological friendly way of uh, farming I think that the Czech uh, agriculture should be less yellow, less colza in springs. Now you can speak. What we've seen is something I deeply identify with. I think these are great objectives for our agriculture. I would, however, like to disagree with what uh, Jan Vladislav uh, Mikos said, because we can't forget about the fact that farmers have to make their living by farming. Uh, farming agriculture is supported by subsidies, obviously, but they the subsidies are limited, and every sub farmer, sustainable or not, has first and foremost uh, the obligation to make his living, provide for him and his family. So, if we want to divide farms into micro areas of two hectares, this is something surreal. Look at the today's globalized world, the rise in wages. Today's economic model works differently, and uh, you couldn't meet to and and meet. Yes, I would like to react because I might have uh, expressed myself wrong. Because I would like to see a future in which any farmer, regardless of the surface of his cultivated land, 
would do that as a part of a diversified agricultural production. That was my aim. That was my main emphasis. Of course, the question of uh, food prices and market pressure on farmers uh, is another question, obviously caused by intermediaries and food chains, of course. It is a huge uh, problem. I am well aware of that. But I think that um, it would be great diversified production and cultivate more than one crop. Yes, I, I agree and I understood. I want to say that having 100 hectares doesn't allow for a division of two hectare large blocks. It is not sustainable economically. I cooperate with um, financial advisory body in agriculture and I know this really cannot be implemented ever. When we look at the ideal pathway for agriculture, obviously areas should be adjusted, but sometimes um, it is good to have small surfaces and sometimes larger. We need to follow the needs and conditions of uh, the land we have at our disposal if uh, there are if there is varied terrain, we should take it into consideration. We shouldn't get rid of um, small forests and so on, obviously. But on the other hand, there are places where water management measures are contraproductive, contraproductive so we need to get rid of them, but not at a general level. Farmers first need to make their living and produce sufficient amount of food. I think we've already mentioned that food does not equal agricultural products. Agricult farmers need to produce their primary agricultural products and in 80 percent uh, case of cases, um, the production is exceeding the, what we knew need, and those primary agricultural products are exported. The problem is that uh, the Czech Republic does not want to transform those primary products within the Czech Republic in order to provide for food safety and subsistence. subsistence. I think that uh, self-sufficient farming should be our goal. But dividing farm areas into micro blocks, uh, into micro agriculture areas is a dystopic. I would like to come back to a question which has happened somewhat of, a, of an elephant in the room. So let us face it. I think that 99% uh, of farmers use subsidies. If we know what the objectives are, if we know that farmers do not produce only food processed products, but that they have also impact on landscape and public health. They provide an array of public services. Their role is really vast, so they should be supported more, which is not the case. The question is, um, is there a tool or where is the problem to uh, use subsidies in order to achieve public interests. Uh, what do you think about the subsidy policy? Should it be reformed or cancelled? Let us talk about it and we can take on radical point views. 
Tohle už je druhá otázka, která by sama stačila na diskusi. I must say znovu o tom, co říkal pan I will repeat myself. ty dotace Just as Jan said, have multiple objectives. One is to develop agriculture in a certain way. The second is to support financially farmers. We must say, and I really do know that from my experience, the European Union has by far the strictest rules on the content of agricultural products on uh, animal welfare and so on, which is non-existent anywhere else in the world. We claim ourselves to be an open economy. Uh, we have to compensate for the imports of um, those farmers from different countries who do not have to follow these rules. We would have worse food because it would be cheaper and this is the consumer's behavior. They buy cheapest products and that would really decrease the overall well level of uh, the European food production. So I don't think subsidies should be cancelled. Uh, they should be reformed, however, to promote our interests better. Over the last years, we, we, we've seen that agricultural is a very conservative sector and farmers do not really wish to change their ways of operating. operating. So, the European Union really tries to strike the right balance, um, not going into too radical changes, because there are some radical changes and re reformed measures that are voluntary, however, and we can, con we can say that only a limited number of farmers follow these, these measures. And this might probably be improved. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question. What can we do about that? You mentioned that the European Commission uh, does uh, promote the, the strategy and um, ambitious goals for environment protection, but at the same time, the ongoing negotiations of the future European budget illustrate the power of agricultural lobby, which makes it impossible to achieve those ambitions. So, what can we do about this? That is a good question. I would like to hear uh, Jan Steffel's take on this. How to enforce farmers and make their voices heard? Maybe they uh, should express their opinion, and if they did, different decisions could be adopted, probably. I think that that it is up to the society to, ex to put more pressure on governments because currently the pressure is to keep the situation as it is now it is to block any change and we need to we need to change this situation Je to potřeba tady ten dotační systém vidět v širších The subsidy system must be seen in a larger context. I have been cooperating with the, the European Union representatives since 2004 within one expert committee and during the seven year long programming budget period experts are discussing about 
the priorities of uh, European subsidies and national subsidies and so on. If you want to know what the solution is, it is fairly simple. I think the Czech Republic is an example showing that good ideas of the common agricultural policy can be applied in a bad manner in the Czech Republic because the objective now is to decouple agricultural subsidies from uh, the size of production which distorts the market. I need to repeat that prices of primary agricultural products are dictated by the world market with minor fluctuations depending on the region. In Europe, the United States, the price will fluctuate in the margin of 10 or 15 percent. But it is dictated by the rule of demand and supply. The market today produces just enough or even a bit more than necessary. That is why uh, we, we waste uh, agricultural products and we waste food especially. So the market produces enough. And I always give the example of using primary agricultural tools uh, in the field. I always give the example of a spade, which only costs uh, an amount of money. Uh, and uh, people always ask for a price. And they always ask for cheaper products, for producing them in a cheaper way. Here in the Czech Republic, we, uh, if we compare to Africa or other regions or Canada or Australia, we uh, want to have a landscape that is sustainable and agriculture which is well functioning. And if we want to have a certain level of natural protection, we want to have standards and restrictions. I said that the Czech Republic should serve as a bad example of rules that are set by the European Commission and unfortunately there is a certain amount of voluntary measures in the case of the Czech Republic. Whatever is voluntarily, voluntary won't really be implemented. We don't want to uh, compromise. We don't want to get rid of agro complexes. We don't want to get rid of big farms, big players. Um, the European Commission says otherwise. They say, yes, maybe there is a tendency toward um, bigger farming actors, bigger farms, but at the same time there is a need for small farmers, uh, for uh, farmers that are active in the countryside, on the local level. Of course, we will have a farmer who, um, for example, feeds the region of Prague. Um, they will have a big farm and a big cooperative, but uh, if you look at, at it on a smaller level, uh, if you look at private farmers who really are there on the level of a municipality or uh, in the countryside, they look at the very land, they look at where there is a pond, what the soil is like. So we do need family farms and I and my wife actually see this. I would like to say that about 80% of the products should be produced by small farmers. If we look at it uh, uh, and speak about the whole planet, about 90% of all agricultural products are produced by small farmers. 
This is a very important category that will help to spread the agricultural production in the countryside that will contribute to introducing the right features of landscape. For example, these are farmers who have small areas of land, uh, who have 20 times two hectare uh, areas with different crops on each of the areas. And if they um, manage their own land on a smaller level, uh, it is very natural for them to have a diversity of crops and smaller areas. Unfortunately, here in the Czech Republic, with the socialist era, we uh, have a different situation. Everything changed a lot. People are, uh, or uh, people in the agriculture tend to concentrate the production on big areas. We, with our association, um, also have um, excursions in Austria and abroad. And if you look at big uh, farmers uh, abroad, uh, they uh, always prefer efficiency and they have enough uh, agricultural products so therefore they don't really need uh, to combine efficiency and intensity they don't really need to take the way of intensive farming because they have enough products intensive farming would of course uh, represent a big burden a big pressure on the landscape it would um, destroy the nature destroy water uh, if you uh, use chemical substances, this can be dangerous, and we have seen uh, examples of that. But in some parts of the world, they don't really need to use uh, intensive farming and still have a lot of products. Unfortunately, this is not the case in the Czech Republic at the moment. I think, Mr. Steffel, that you actually just repeated my vision, right? Uh, this vision of small families farmers with small pieces of uh, land so you see that this is possible and I also want to pick up on another thing on the fact that uh, the European Union uh, suggests some measures as voluntary and doesn't make them obligatory. This is because there is uh, the Council of Ministers and they say that they don't want to have it obligatory, so it is them who decide. It would have to be accepted by all the ministers who aren't willing to have obligatory measures. So, in fact, um, the ministers um, don't agree to make it obligatory for everyone, and then you have the Austrian minister who comes back to his country and still sticks to the measure, makes it obligatory, but uh, the Czech minister who rejects it. We were speaking about the importance of small and family farms, and we know that in Europe, unfortunately, small farms are disappearing. I think one four, um, a quarter of them disappeared between uh, 2003 and 2013. Uh, so I don't, uh, I don't think that um, working in the field of family farming isn't uh, really um, popular or isn't really promising for young people today. I would like to ask about it. Alena. Well, we have been speaking about agriculture, but we forget about people, about the consumers. I think that the sense of work in agriculture is to grow plants or breed animals in order to uh, provide people with uh, products they need. So I think we should raise awareness among uh, consumers about what does it mean um, to buy something? What is it? What food is? I think that um, the reality 
um, is um, not very visible and not very clear to the consumers. We have the subsidies and also uh, the quantity of substances that are needed for producing uh, different uh, materials and different products simply aren't known among the public. Therefore, the public isn't motivated to buy products, for example, because of the amount of gas or uh, of oil uh, which is used for the transport. Of course, that I cannot persuade anyone to just buy a more expensive product. And of course, the prices um, are distorted. And of course, people want to buy cheap products. The topic is really complex. And it would uh, be possible to discuss uh, for hours about this. But in my opinion, the future is buying local, producing local. I hope uh, people will prefer local carrot uh, to uh, an important car imported carrot, which may be cheaper, but I don't know in w which way it was produced, if it was uh, organic, um, who produced it, and so on. So I would always prefer local and environmentally friendly farming. I would like uh, to see people protecting soil, protecting land. Uh, if you look at the Czech Republic, you see that the situation is very diverse and we cannot really generalize, not even at the level of the Czech Republic, not even at the level of regions in the Czech Republic. So, I'm not an economist and I'm not a politician, but I think that the subsidies should be directed towards a change in agriculture. We should find a new uh, way of managing our land, a regenerative management, and we shouldn't be only looking at how to design subsidies, but at how to change our treatment of land. We should be paying attention to the specialists um, looking at uh, our care of land. There are specialists who should be present, not in Prague, but who should be looking at um, land management and agriculture in uh, the regions, in, but at the local level. And now, Mr. Miko. We were speaking about the price of food. For example, we know that the supermarket pushed the prices down via discount policies and so on. And often it is said that the organic products aren't accessible to the broad public. So I would like to ask you, what do you think is the optimum way and if we can afford uh, organic food in the Czech Republic, if we don't have better pay conditions. Well, first I would like to react. Uh, I completely agree uh, with this idea of local or regional experts that could give advice on how to treat land properly. But at the same time, I must uh, say that we don't really have any experts like this and our education system isn't producing any. Actually, we only raise and educate people who uh, actually tend to the intensive farming. They learn this, or sometimes the education system produces a taxonomist or someone who is specialized in categorizing different types of farming. But we don't really have uh, people who are raised by this education system and who would be experts uh, on regional farming. It is only by chance that sometimes they reach this 
And I think this should be encouraged. I think people should go to the field, look at the farmers who work there. And this is a big issue of our education system. I would like to change this, and it is really difficult, nearly impossible. And now let's speak about the prices. The process is very lengthy, and I could be speaking for hours about that. But we have heard some interesting and important ideas. We need to include externalities, price externalities into the final price tag, including all the costs. Then our organic and healthy food would be cheaper than food currently sold in supermarkets. But the current system doesn't allow for such a situation, and that is a huge problem, because the current economic system would have to be transformed, and it wouldn't, it can't be transformed if it isn't for the pressure from the public, from for pressure from the public. What we can see is that currently, poor people are everywhere, obviously, and. In spite of that, securing sufficient food only accounts for roughly 30% of total income. So if we want to have higher quality food products, we can pay a bit more. It is a completely different situation to the past when 80% of income was consumed by food. And in other parts of the world, this ratio is less than 10% in um, the United Kingdom in, in particular. So this leaves consumer with a bit more money to support small farmers, sustainable environment and healthy food. We can see that this has been changing slightly um, 10 years ago only one percent of people preferred organic food now it is roughly ten percent so i think that we are on the right track i would like to address jan steffel you can also react i have one more question for you we have been mentioning one specific attitude of sustainable agriculture, uh, which works with nature, social and economic aspects, which uh, promotes less mechanization. These attitudes, I think, can be commonly referred to as agroecology, which is less known in the Czech Republic, but I hope that not for long. But there is a different approach based on technology, robotization, digitalization, uh, also referred to as precision agriculture. Uh, which lies in collecting data and then precise directioning, directing, directing of our agricultural practices. What do you think about those two approaches? Aren't there they exclusive of one another today? Subsidies are directed into precision no. agriculture. So, what's your take on this? These technologies, I think, are absolutely compatible. But we are sometimes confused by the names we give to things. When we talk about ecological attitudes, sustainable attitudes, we think that we have to have sustainable certifications, eco-certifications, which attest to certain land and soil management and so on. You mentioned the notion of agroecology. This means that when you are 
farmer, you should also be interested in farming ecology. When you use industry fertilizers, use them reasonably and use these technologies that you have at your disposal. This is the aim of uh, precision agriculture. Uh, it, uh, of course, manages um, tractors and fields and dosage of fertilizers. But this is not the only uh, measure, the only aspect. And I know that the Ministry of Agriculture knows this because I was present at a meeting when the Ministry himself corrected this uh, bad conception and he explained that precision agriculture consists in processing data about uh, management and conceiving strategies based on those uh, on this data, strategies of improving or sustaining the current agriculture sector. I would also like to react to one point uh, mentioned previously. We should distinguish two different things, between two different things. I am a sustainable farmer and I know that it is impossible for the whole country or the majority of Czech land to engage in sustainable agricultural practices. Obviously, it is much better for the Czech landscape. Um, but there is one drawback, and that is that it reduces by 30 percent the productivity of the agricultural production. And that could be dangerous in 2050. Uh, we could uh, be faced with uh, a different, uh, a difficult situation of food insecurity. We need to have a certain number of agri ecologically oriented farmers, those would take clever decisions based on precise facts, but with certain limits, with no exaggerations. I think that those who are willing to be organic farmers, they should go for it. The Czech Republic is open to it. Um, we need to have those people with this good relationship towards uh, nature. But the wrong way to do is to prefer industrial intensive agriculture. Uh, precision agriculture, sustainable organic agriculture is disliked by, sorry, intensive agriculture is uh, badly seen by the Czech Agrarian Chamber. We need to realize that there cannot be, everyone cannot be an, a sustainable farmer. Because if we had them, their intensity of production would have to be increased. We don't, however, know what the situation will be in 2015. That is why no exaggeration, please. The main problem of the Czech Republic is that um, it's different. Um, and it is that it is not that we have some middle-sized farms uh, who are, which are sustainable, provide for all their families, they work in a natural way, they divide the landscape in a natural way. They diversify the landscape and so on. This is really not the problem. I don't like to hear uh, the idea that intensive farmers are 
educated in the current schooling system. No farmer is produced by the current education system at all. Again, let us suppose we would have um, many family farms. That would be the best solution. Let us do it. Family farms create natural farmers. The sons and daughters of those family naturally get um, the right relationship with uh, agriculture and nature. And in precision agriculture, you need real specialists. You need experts in the technological intricacies of those of those machines. So that is really different because those people, on the other hand, needn't uh, know that much about, uh, about land and so on. Moreover, it is incredibly important to see and walk around the field to cultivate it well. Currently, no technology can do that. No technology will tell you which technology you should choose, how should you diversify your landscape. It is up to us to do. One last point, if you have 3,000 hectares, it is very difficult to incorporate landscape features. Um, while this is something very naturally done by family farmers. So the system really needs to be changed. And one more thing about subsidies. I don't think the rules are bad. Their application is. We farmers discussed about this all the time. We have uh, direct payments on one hand who are criticized uh, for being too automatic. The truth is, this is how the situation works in the Czech Republic, but not in Germany or different countries. In Germany, they have um, a limit on this. And for, for farmers larger than 300 hectares, direct payments are not applicable. But they can, they are eligible for different subsidies different aids. But this direct payment coupled with surface is um, quite simple. The rules are simple. But most importantly, the objective of this subsidy is to provide for uh, the subsistence and the capacity of the farmer to go on and to make his living, his viability. So uh, sometimes this subsidy is really crucial. It sometimes makes up for half of um, a household's income. So it is interesting to see that in Germany there is this limit, uh, because uh, when there are adverse climate conditions, different subsidies are applied, but in Germany they say no, you have this basic subsidy scheme, you can use it if you're successful, if you are not, you will use this subsidy and you will use it as a crisis management tool. So these are those basic payments that are simple and there, there is a whole variety of other so-called investment payments directed at modernization mechanisms. They are a bit more complex, but that uh, they are not used by small farmers. Uh, the red tape connected with them is just overwhelming, so they are generally not used. But the system is ready for that, and if you use it correctly, it works. See, our Western neighbors use it well, Polish use it, Polish use it well, the Hungarians use it well. So um, I think that the biggest problem lies in the Czech's intensive agricultural system, which is really a disaster.
Do we have some reactions? Yes. Well, we need to keep it short, but I would like to mention just one thing. Uh, speaking about uh, modern technology and precise farming, I'm not against. But I don't think this should replace the fact that we destroy the quality of the land and then try to make up with using precise farming. I think precise farming should be just something extra to improve the way we do our farming. And so far, I haven't come across a model of intensive farming, of extensive production that wouldn't degrade the soil or the land. The best models can keep the quality of the, sa of the soil more or less the same, but most of them actually destroy it. And uh, also, agriculture contributes to climate change because um, carbon uh, that is fixed in the soil uh, is then extracted and liberated to the air. And this is a process that cannot be easily stopped. So we cannot just look at the volume of crops uh, and of yields that we want to produce. We can, for example, use uh, hydroponic uh, plant growing. And we need to maintain the quality standards of our soil. We need to keep the carbon in the soil. And precise farming is just an extra way that we can use. But the basis is to keep it all based on uh, the uh, natural principles. And if we don't stick to them, we will never reach the ideal goal. OK, we have only 13 minutes left. And I now have also a couple of questions from our audience. I think some of them were partly answered. But we have one that is actually along the lines of what I wanted to ask. And it speak about, speaks about uh, agriculture as a resource of emissions. Uh, I would like to ask about um, the cattle breeding, uh, which is responsible for about 34% uh, of emissions in agriculture. And uh, this is also because uh, the uh, food for uh, animal, animals that are bred uh, needs to be transported, which also produces emissions. Um, I know that at the moment in the Czech Republic, uh, the animal production is responsible for about 6% of emissions. So I would like to ask, uh, do you think that uh, in the future, um, in this ideal future of agriculture, what will be the share of animal production? Please, uh, Madam Malikova, the floor is yours. I will let Mr. Miko express himself. I just wanted to say that uh, myself, I am against um, any quotas. I think that uh, there is a big potential to bioregions. So, for example, uh, there are um, backgrounds and environments uh, that are very well suited for, for example, uh, breeding sheep or uh, cows. And we also mentioned the topic of um, surpluses. We have an overproduction at the moment. So maybe let's look at a more sustainable agriculture. And I don't support uh, reducing um, animal production on a general level, reducing, uh, for example, organic farms, uh, which manage their cattle in a very responsible way. For example, I know that in Austria, uh, cattle is bred uh, without adding uh, carbon to the air. 
So I think that there should be a permanent cooperation with consumers. Let's look at how much we need to produce. Let's try to find a balance. The balance between the producers and consumers, I think it is missing at the moment. People don't really know where their food comes from. So we should have more discussion about um, agriculture and I don't want general solutions. I want um, us to learn. I want us to learn responsible ways. I want us to learn to be more sensitive, to have intuition. And this is a long process, of course. Um, also, the demand for meat uh, varies from region to region. In cities, uh, uh, there is less demand for meat at the moment. So maybe I would like to appeal to our common sense. Uh, I don't want to, to prohibit uh, animal husbandry, of course, but I think we, this should be done with a common sense in mind. I would like to have two short notes. First, our agriculture uh, contributes to the climate uh, problem uh, by 6%. Um, this is actually uh, determined by a mathematical calculation. Um, multiplied by the number of cows. In reality, uh, this is different and probably the share of uh, the agriculture is bigger. No one can really uh, determine the amount of uh, CO2 which is released into the atmosphere because of atmosphere. For example, uh, we know that there is less organic material in the soil. It decreased by one half. Uh, so this is one example. Uh, the, the contribution of uh, agriculture to climate problems is underestimated. Then, second, uh, if we prohibit uh, sheep breeding or cow breeding, this isn't the solution. Cows and sheep are a natural part of our ecosystem. Um, there are other animals and uh, plants that live in relationship with them. I don't think we shouldn't have cows because we then would need to have machinery to mow meadows uh, and we would need uh, to produce uh, fertilizers which can naturally be produ produced by cows. Of course, I'm oversimplifying matters, but I would like to point out that the natural um, uh, animals that were present in our landscape uh, are no more there. We replace them with cows, and if we then get rid of the cows, uh, there will be a problem in the ecosystem. Also, uh, the problem is not really cows. The problem is intensive uh, farming and intense uh, demand on meat. So we shouldn't get rid of meat. Maybe we should eat less of it. OK, we only have seven minutes now. And now, maybe if uh, Jan Steffel, uh, Steffel wants to react, no, you can also do so. But I would like to ask about um, one thing to conclude. I would like to ask you, uh, we, was, we were speaking about things that should be changed, but I would like to ask you what is the best practice which is already happening in the Czech Republic. Okay, I would like to first speak about the cattle and then get to your question. Well, we need the cattle in the Czech nature. I always remember an example we learned at school, an example uh, on eating healthy, eating spinach. Uh, well, uh, 
throughout time, we learned that this wasn't the case and that spinach wasn't so indispensable. And sometimes I think when I look at these calculations, at these contributions to the climate change, I think that somehow the people who make these calculations forget about the benefits of the cattle, who of course produce emissions, but they also have a positive side to them. And of course, uh, if we have um, more uh, herbivores, uh, if we have more plants uh, that produce more um, oxygen, we will need more cattle who will eat uh, the plants. And um, as Madame Marikova said, I think we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't give general rules and prohibit everything. We should appeal to the common sense. We should um, let the market to decide. People aren't stupid and they can manage. And now let's get to your question. Um, speaking on the positive side, well, I don't think that the Czech uh, agriculture is doing poorly. I think that our nature, our landscape is quite well kept um, and well preserved. We uh, simply uh, need to get more diversity, to uh, get better care of the land, to add more organic material into the soil. Uh, but uh, slowly uh, the environment is trans and the agriculture is transforming. Uh, it is being more varied and uh, I think things are getting more and more natural and it is possible in these times. Speaking about the subsidies, they actually help. I think it all makes sense. We only need to coordinate the direction of the Czech Republic with the direction of the European Union. No, Madame Malikova. I think uh, it is a pity that we spend so much time speaking about money. Of course, uh, without money there is no movement. I would have liked to discuss the topic of our interconnectedness with nature and we shouldn't really demand things from nature, we should cooperate with nature. And uh, to mention Wilfried Hartl, who had a very nice uh, seminar on how to treat our land, he mentioned that uh, we should try to gain experience from nature, to gain empathy to actually know what the nature needs and to develop it. And the agricultures should um, help each other and understand each other. And one example of best practice, well, I am happy that um, the, the area which is managed in an eco-friendly way is getting bigger and bigger, so I'm really grateful. Um, this environmental friendly farming is developing. There is a platform which looks at crops uh, for um, organic farming. I'm happy that more and more landowners are responsible uh, and they have new contracts for uh, new tenants and they um, actually make it obligatory for them to manage the land in a more responsible way. So these are some of the examples I had in my mind. Uh, here in Přibor, we have a cooperative uh, which uh, supports a responsible, responsible way of farming and also eating healthy. I personally know farmers who produce our food and we have mutual respect. Thank you. Now Mr. Miko. I should, uh, I would like to be short and brief. 
Uh, I would like to show you this one book, uh, Life in the Soil. Um, I'm happy that more and more people understand how important soil is and how much life there is in it. We have been shooting documentaries about land and soil, and to, it was easier and easier for us to find uh, agriculturals who actually were interested in the life uh, in their soil in the insects, in all organisms that contribute in producing our farming products. They try, or they start to see this as an integral part of farming. And uh, the demand is on the rise for things that were mentioned by Madame Malikova. For example, there is a new web page, a new advisory web page for landowners uh, to realize what they should um, demand in their contracts from their tenants in order to preserve land. I think this is really crucial and this is a very good tendency. Thank you to you all and thanks for these optimistic remarks. I would also uh, like to re-mention this foundation of partnership, which uh, raises awareness among landowners. Um, I would like to encourage you to um, look for uh, responsible farmers, organic farmers. We have a, a registry of them. Uh, and also, I would like to encourage you to um, be interested in the ways of uh, land management. There are a number of petitions you can take part in, some of them also uh, organized by our organization, Duha. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your replies. And now to wrap up, I would like to invite you uh, to watch another panel uh, of our Inspiration Forum. Tomorrow uh, there is the evening which is called Vietnam Stories and you will be able to join it via Facebook, YouTube and so on. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Goodbye.